Hello, and welcome to this talk about serverless side-by-side -side extensions with Azure Durable Functions, or how to make um, a stateless system meet some state. Before I start with um, my talk, I would shortly like to introduce myself. My name is Christian Lechner. I'm heading the Microsoft Azure team at a company called Minosphere, which is the innovation lab of MSG. And um, I'm not originally from the Microsoft ecosystem, I'm from the SAP ecosystem, and I'm, I'm around this ecosystem since 2005. I think I'm quite active there. Um, currently, I'm spokesman of the Special Interest Group Development at the German-speaking user group. I am SAP Mentor alumnus, and I'm also an SAP Press author. And since the beginning, since I've been around this area of SAP, one of my core focus topics was extensibility. So how could I extend SAP systems to um, meet customer requirements? This area kind of broadened in the last years when SAP brought up the topic of side-by-side uh, -side extensibility. So I dove into um, cloud native development and within the last years, one of my focus topics was um, serverless. If you want to reach out for me, um, here's also my Twitter handle. Okay. So, um, as the title mentioned, we are talking about side-by-side -side extensions in SAP, but with Azure Functions, which is a kind of Microsoft offering. Um, so the question might arise, why, why should we care about Microsoft at all? I mean, we have, we have SAP, we have the SAP Cloud Platform, and so on and so forth. Um, isn't that sufficient? So um, last year, in May 2019, there was Sapphire, and there was the announcement of a thing called SAP Embrace. And this project um, should guide customers to the cloud and um, make the vision of the intelligent enterprise reality. And during the last year, well, it, it came out that there is one preferred partner in the program, and um, that is Microsoft. And so currently there is basically the, the Embrace program is equivalent to the partnership between SAP and Microsoft. And the slogan of this partnership is driving innovation together. So bringing the intelligent enterprise and the intelligent cloud to reality by combining the SAP portfolio and the Microsoft portfolio. And now I'm no longer talking about SAP on Azure or um, deploying the SAP Cloud Platform on Azure as an infrastructure provider, but really bringing together the best of both worlds of SAP and of the Microsoft portfolio in order to enable the customer to make the most out of his business and to enable innovations. So that's why uh, we should kind of broaden our view and also take a look at how can we do extensions of the SAP system with tools, with frameworks, with stuff that is delivered by Microsoft. So the next question would be, how can we benefit from, from, from Azure or from Microsoft as a whole? So we can, um, for example, integrate SAP with Microsoft 365. So for example, a classical um, thingy there would be um, using uh, the, the SAP workflow together with, with Outlook. So you do no longer have to go to the uh, My Inbox Fury app in order to um, release, accept or, or decline a workflow item, but you get an email and you can directly interact with the workflow item from the email without any, any log on to an SAP system. You can also go one step further and uh, blend in Azure services into ABAP. There is an ABAP SDK for Azure, which is open source, which is here uh, linked at GitHub. And so you can combine, for example, let's say some, some pre-trained machine learning services into your ABAP services and make your processing more intelligent or raise the level of automation automization there. And last but not least, and this will be the topic that I will focus on in my talk, we can also do side-by-side -side extensions on Microsoft Azure, bringing together your SAP system with the offerings within Microsoft Azure. As I said before, one of my focus topics 
currently is the serverless world and so I decided to do um, some, some kind of technical proof of concept um, that brings together the, the SAP world and the Microsoft world and I focused only on um, serverless offerings within the Microsoft world. So what, what's depicted here is the scenario that I built which is basically I have an, an ABAP system, an S4 system, where I have installed the ABAP SDK for Azure. And with this ABAP SDK, I address um, the service bus offering within um, Microsoft Azure and send a message there. And this message then triggers a function. So the function is a service offering on Azure, which is Microsoft function. And this function then calls back to another um, SAP system using the SAP Cloud SDK um, and I also used the Azure Key Vault for credential management um, to fetch some additional information and based on the information another message is sent to the, to the event bus and um, based on this message another serverless offering which is a, a low-code offering, um, Logic Apps, then creates an email and in order to show that we are not stuck to the SAP, uh, to the Microsoft ecosystem, it's a Gmail that's, uh, that's created. I have described this scenario within the blog linked here down below. And within the, the talk, we will now focus on one very specific area. Um, and that's this area here. Um, it's how can we build Azure Functions in order to interact with um, the SAP system and how can we overcome some, let's say, basic requirements that come from a cross-functional area. So, for example, what happens if the, the SAP S4 HANA system is not available? What happens if there is a timeout? Um, how do I model circuit breakers or something like that? So how can we harden the system? Now, before we, we dive into that, let's take a first short look at Azure Functions. What are Azure Functions? So, as I said before, Azure Functions are kind of the um, serverless offering of Microsoft. What's important to know is that stuff is completely open source right from the start. So, um, the, the worker runtime that runs the Azure Functions is open source. Um, so, you can also deploy it to Google Cloud Run if you want to. You can even deploy it to uh, Kubernetes if you want to. Now basically um, the, the functions are constructed of two pieces and I want to show that um, within the code. So let's take a look at the code of the function. So this is now the original function that is um, used within the scenario that I sh I've shown before. There are a lot of files. Uh, most of them are, well, not really important um, for uh, for the demos or for the upcoming uh, snippets of code that we take a look at. So there is a lot of infrastructural stuff like the package.json where you have some scripts. Um, and your dependencies, your dev dependencies as usual for a node project that I used here or a TypeScript project to be more precise. And then we have the Azure function, which is here. This Azure function is basically a directory that contains two files. One is the function.json file, um, which is the configuration of your function. This configuration tells the Azure function framework what type of function um, do I use or do I want to implement? How is the function triggered? And what are the input and the output parameters of my function that are then automatically attached to the context of the function? Um, this configuration is called binding. So what you see here, we have uh, two bindings here. One is in an inward direction and one is in an outward direction. This inward binding is a very special binding. It's the trigger. So here I have my service bus trigger um, that listens to a specific uh, topic and subscription and uh, well fetches, fetches its key from a, from a specific value um, within the app configuration. 
And then we have some, some outbound binding, which is kind of the, the parameter that's returned. Here within the scenario, I attached it also to a service bus. And that's basically it. The code itself is then within the index file. Uh, this is now already quite lengthy, as you can see. So I have here my, my Azure function, um, some, some logging going on. And then I basically do two things. I contact the S4 system to get um, the dunning level of a specific uh, business partner that was handed in via the um, original message. And if the dunning level is not zero, I will issue a second call um, to the S4 system to get more details about the customer. And then I will return a message, sending out a message. Um, which then contains all the data about dunning level and the additional data of the customer. These two functions, so the get customer dunning by ID and the get customer data by ID, are here down below um, using the SAP Cloud SDK and the Fluent API in order to fetch the data. What you can see here is um, I have here the um, well input binding that that I get into my function, which is the message from the service bus where I have all the, the information about the business partner. And what you can see here is um, I simply make an outbound message, which is a JSON, um, and I attach it to the context of the function and then the function framework does all the necessary things. So it um, pushes it forward according to the configuration within function.json to the service bus. So um, that's very, very short and crisp how functions work. So you have an atomic piece of code where you have some configuration and some code that's executed on demand, which is the beauty of serverless. So you only pay when the function is called, you do not have to care about scaling or something like that. And in addition, um, you can really focus on your business logic, as you can see here. So I do not have to focus on how do I attach to the to the service bus in order to propagate my message. I, I configure my, my well, connection string of the service bus, and then I simply attach my message to the context and that's it. So it's it's very um, a lean way to do your business logic. Um, however, there are also some, let's say, um, principles and best practices that you have to respect when it comes to the functions. Um, and this is what I want to show you on the next slide. So serverless from my perspective is great but there are some some draw some kind of drawbacks let's put it that way um, or some some principles that you have to consider so you have um, one point that is simply well a basic principle of functions functions are stateless so you cannot handle state within a function at least not directly then one of the best practices functions must not call other functions why because if one function calls another function, it has to wait until the other function returns. Um, and this would kind of lead to a, to a strange situation because I only want to pay for what I use within a serverless world. However, the outer function that's calling the inner function is waiting until the inner function is finished. So I pay for, for, for something that is idle. And that's, that's not the idea behind serverless. And there is another point um, that is a best practice, is that functions should only do one thing and do this one thing well, which is quite cool from a design perspective, but which might also become quite, um, quite challenging when you design your function. As you can see, um, we have already um, kind of done something that that 
does not meet this best practice because we do two calls to two um, uh, um, to two or to two an SAP system within the same function, which is well, kind of debatable if we should put that apart. But later on, well, we we should try to overcome this this kind of, of design flavor. Now, keeping all these principles and best practices in mind, we are stateless. Functions must not call other functions, so I cannot easily model a, a chain of functions. And functions should only do one thing. The question is, as soon as we go into the enterprise world, we will have business processes. And this process will be something like workflows. So when we want to use serverless, we have to have some option to model this workflow-like processes. So in other words, although functions are stateless, we need some kind of state. Well, there is a way to achieve that, and that's the typical way if you want to do function chaining and to achieve state. So you take one function, and this function does its thing, then it well maybe writes its uh, stuff to the uh, to the database, uh, issues a message or something like that, and well then based on this message, based on the event that the message was created, the second function kicks off, and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, this has some problems. So even if I model such a workflow in, in that way, and that's possible, and there are a lot of examples of this pattern, the relation between the function is not clear. So I have those functions, and the functions react to events, but I in, at no point it, during during design time, I really have a clear overview about the relation between the functions. Then I have to establish message queues in order to propagate some information between the functions. And I have to manage those queues. So this, these are kind of a necessary evil. If I want to have a context that has to be shared up across the functions, I, I need to store that in a DB and I'm responsible for that. And what you can be quite sure is error handling becomes super complex because, well, at every stage here, something can go wrong. And as we all know, as we are developers, something will go wrong. And to find that out is, is quite cumbersome in such a scenario. Okay, so um, should we give up on, on serverless? within the SAP ecosystem um, and with, with Microsoft, Microsoft Azure? Well, no, because Microsoft is was and is quite aware of this requirement and they developed an add-on to Azure Functions, of course also open source, um, which is called Durable Functions. Um, they are simply made to make your life easier to develop this workflow kind of things with Azure Functions. So um, as an extension to the Azure Function Framework, they are purely serverless. They preserve a local state via a concept called event sourcing. However, even if you do not know the concept, it doesn't matter because it's all handled behind the scenes. So all the heavy work that is shown um, in the pattern on the previous slide is handled by the framework. You do not have to care about that. It all happens behind the curtains. And in addition, as there are some, some other challenges coming up when um, you do this event sourcing, you have support in front of the curtain with additional features that come along with, with Azure Durable Functions that I will show later in the, in the demos. So um, let's take a look how this works from a conceptual point of view. So let's say we have some, some pseudocode, so we want to call an, an activity a function f1. We want to wait for the uh, result. 
then um, we want to call a function f2 with the result of the first call and with that result we want to call a third function and return the result of that. So we have a, a, a classical sequence of calls of functions. Within Azure Durable Functions, this, this scenario is split up into three parts. We have three different types of um, functions. One is the so-called trigger function. This is the one that you, you interact with. So um, this is the one that you call in order to um, trigger the durable function. Then you have an orchestrator, and as the name intends, this one orchestrates all the single activities that have to be executed. So we have here um, an activity f1, f2, f3, and this orchestrator is responsible that these activity functions get triggered at the right point in time and get the right information that they need. So um, when we now start the process, the trigger function will be called, the trigger function will um, send a message out to the, the orchestrator and will kind of trigger the orchestrator via an event. Then the trigger function will lay itself to sleep, so you will no longer pay for the trigger function and the orchestrator function will wake up. The orchestrator function will um, take a look at the event. It will see, ah, okay, I have these three tasks that I have to execute, so I will schedule the first task, put that, uh, the, the necessary information in a, in a queue, and then I will go to sleep and the Azure Function Framework will pick up the first activity that is scheduled by the orchestrator. The activity will do its thing, will return the information that it's, or the result from its calculation, and the show begins from the start. The orchestrator will take a look at the tasks within its kind of schedule, say, okay, I have scheduled my first function, um, the function returned a result, so I will schedule the second function, and the second function will kick off until everything um, is finished. Uh, so to, to sum it up, or to put it in one slide, durable functions are something like that. You have an orchestration trigger that simply triggers all the, sim the, the single activities until the job is done. So that was it from a, from a conceptual point of view. So now let's take a look at how this um, is solved within code and what more quite cool stuff comes along with uh, the, the Azure Durable Functions. And one very nice thing with Azure Functions in general and with Durable Functions is that you can do a lot of development locally. So you do not have to um, get an Azure account, for example. I have to state, um, and here, sorry to all the Mac users, this is um, possible for Windows users, so that's officially supported. For Mac users, there is um, also something that you can use, but um, I, I have no Mac, so I couldn't try it, so I don't know if that really works out smoothly, but for Windows users, everything works out smoothly. So what do you have to do? Um, for local development, and all my demos will be local, that I will show you from now on, you um, need to install the Azure Function Runtime, so kind of the, the overall runtime in order to execute functions. Then you have to install Azure Durable Functions, so the, the extension. Um, that's a simple npm install. And then you have to install some more stuff in order to handle the state, in order to handle um, the messages that are exchanged between the orchestrator and the activities. So you have to install the Microsoft SQL Server Express, which is a very uh, lean SQL database, SQL Server database that's installed on your Windows system. Um, for those who are afraid of installing something that's called Express because they installed HANA Express, this is really a one-click installation. It takes some time, but you 
do not have to do a lot in order to make it work with durable functions. Then you have to install the Microsoft Azure Storage Emulator. Why? Because functions interact with um, Azure Storage and this has to be emulated. And this is all this thing does. It's quite easy. It's also one click install. And last but not least, you have to install or you can install the Azure Storage Explorer. This is a tool that you install on prem. Um, you can use for exploration of your storage within Azure, but also for your local storage. Um, you do not need it to execute all the stuff, um, but I highly recommend it because this allows you to take a look, a little bit of peek behind the curtains. Um, for those of you who, who want to go along, I also have a little walkthrough um, video that I recorded on how to install all that stuff on a Windows system. So if you're interested in, you can take a look at that. Okay, so now let's pick up some challenges and let's see how we can evolve our project um, from one simple Azure function to um, a quite sophisticated um, durable function. So first of all, what I said um, before, I have one single activity function and this single activity function um, calls the S4 system and it does the call twice from one activity, which is, well, not that cool. So what I want to do within the first step is I want to make use of the um, durable function framework in order to orchestrate those two calls. So I will have, I, I want to have a target state that consists of an orchestrator and um, that orchestrates one activity that calls the S4 system and if this call is done it will call um, the second activity that will then call the S4 system. So let's take a look how this um, looks like within the code. So what I will do now is I um, will check out the corresponding branch that you can see here. And um, I have switched now from a function that is triggered by um, a service bus to a function that is triggered by an HTTP call. I just did that for demo purposes because this way I can more easily trigger the function. So um, this one no longer exists. So let's take a look at the new structure of our project. So now we have um, different functions. So we have four functions and we will start with the trigger function. So the one that you call in order to trigger the, the um, orchestration. This one again consists of a configuration. Um, it's a so-called HTTP trigger, so I can trigger it via an HTTP call. And it um, serves as a route to my orchestrator. So I can um, route that to different orchestrators. I can define which methods are allowed. And um, I simply um, return an HTTP message. What's also important here is this little part. So we have a binding an import binding, um, which is identifying this function as a, as a starter function for a durable um, orchestrator. Um, this configuration tells the Azure function runtime that this function is allowed to kick off an orchestrator. And this is what we will see within the index TS. So this is um, a quite easy function. So what we have here is we um, get um, a client based on the context from the durable function functions um, framework and when, then we will create an instance of um, the orchestrator or of the of the environment handing over the function name from the http call so handing over the orchestrator name and handing over all the parameters and that's basically it this is the function that was used as an input. Then we go one step further. We take a look at the orchestrator. So the guy who orchestrates all the activities. This is configured via uh, the binding of an orchestration trigger. So again, 
nothing more for you to do. You just say, hey, this function is an orchestration trigger. And then within the function, you can do your orchestration. And um, now you can see it's really clear and easy to model a sequence. You can also model a fan out, fan in pattern to execute more activities in parallel. That's another pattern that's supported by, by durable functions. But as you can see here, it's, it's really straightforward and you see how the different activity functions play together just when looking at the orchestrator. So I will call my first activity, I will wait. So here we have the yield keyword because we are using generator functions or the, the durable framework uses generator functions in order to model um, the, the stepwise execution. So we have here the yield keyword. We wait for this um, for this activity, for this function to return. We hand over some input. Um, then based on the result, we enhance the input for the next activity, call the next activity, and then we return the detailed data. So that's basically it. Super easy. And now when we take a look at the real activities, I will take a look at the first activity. Um, we have here again the configuration which tells the framework, hey, I am an activity. So I'm type of activity trigger. And then within the function, I simply, well, do my things. So I call here via this asynchronous function out to um, the S4 system and, um, well, return the stuff or, well, if an error occurs, I throw an error. So now, as we took a look at all that stuff, let's take a look how this stuff um, works out. So what I did is I already fired up my Azure storage emulator, as you can see here. I have my, my endpoints for my different um, storage types that are available in, in Azure usually. And all that stuff is um, hitting a local endpoint of my SQL Express database. And I can take a look at that in my Azure Storage Explorer. So now I will fire up my function, which is based on uh, the scripts that are available within the function. So I will npm run start, which will then uh, build my project. As I said, I have a TypeScript um, implemented function, and then it will fire up the function. And um, well, there is, is quite some information going on here. So what happens is uh, the framework will Let's go up here, uh, pick up all the four functions that it found, uh, load the extension of durable tasks and, and does its things. And at the end of the day, I have an HTTP endpoint that is exposed. I have to enter here the name of the orchestrator and then the orchestrator will kick off. What's important to understand is the orchestrator will kick off asynchronously. So when I kick off the orchestrator, I have to, to well ask the orchestrator at a later point in time, hey, what's your state? Um, so let's do that. I have here a little um, add-on installed within Visual Studio Code where I can very easily model HTTP calls. And I will now call my orchestrator function based on this uh, data here. And I will send the request. And what happens now, the, the request is accepted and I get back an URL. And as I'm lazy, I will copy it, put it into my browser. Now let's see what happened. Okay, so let's make that a bit bigger. So we have here the name, we have the instance ID, its status, it's completed. I have the input data that I put into it. Yes, let's take a look. So this was the input data that I put into it. And then I have some output data that is um, well given back by the, by the durable function, where I have now the full name of the customer and I have the dunning level of the customer. Taking a look, as I said, behind the curtains, um, I have to refresh here. I will go to my local development. I have here now two tables. I have the instances. So this is 
um, the area where my durable instance is is stored um, where I have my, my input in where I have my output stored so it's kind of a where I have my route stored that I called uh, I have my output here so this is kind of a, of a quick overview of what um, what was the the input and the output and then I also have can have a deeper look into um, the execution by going to this um, history table and what I will see now is what I modeled schematically on my slides. The execution started and the orchestrator is kicked off. Next, when the orchestrator is kicked off, it will schedule a task and the orchestrator will set itself to sleep. After that, the task is executed and when it's completed, it returns the dunning level um, as intended by our code and the orchestrator wakes up again. This function goes to sleep and the next task is scheduled. So the next function is scheduled. The orchestrator lays itself to sleep. The next function is executed, which then um, adds some additional, additional information, the orchestrator kicks off, it will see, hey, there is nothing more to do. So um, the execution is finished and the orchestrator completes its work. So we see here the, the complete information about all the things that happened here. Okay, so um, let's clear up the things just for the, the sake that we can see a bit more when the next execution kicks off. Uh, clear all would be the right command. Okay, so now nothing is there anymore. We can clear that up. So um, what do we have achieved up to now? We have now split up our single function into two activities that are orchestrated by one orchestrator. I think we can also stop that one. Yep. So, um, what can we do next? What might be a next scenario? Let's take a look. So, the next scenario would be what should I do if an error happens when I call the S4HANA cloud system? Should the, the function go down as it would go now? Or should there be some, let's say, retries that we want to do in order to, um, well, come around some, some temporal outages of the backend system? And the next question, if we want to do that, and I guess we want to do that, how can we achieve that? Is there any support from the framework or do I have to put in some, some while loops and some timeouts and... Uh, uh, has the activity to run, even if it does nothing, just wait for, for something to happen. Um, the good message is Azure Functions supports you again. So um, let's check out the corresponding branch and let's try to avoid typos. Okay, okay. Here we go. So um, nothing changed here within the, the structure because all that we have to do in order to achieve that is to do some configuration. So what we have to do is we have to call a different method. We do not no longer call activity but we call activity with retry, which tells the framework, please retry this call if an error happens, if this activity issues an exception. And we specify some retry options, how this should happen. So what we have here within the retry options, we, we create a, a new um, retry options object and we take some information out of the um, out of the app configuration, so kind of the, the global configuration, which is when should we first retry. Um, 
what is the max number of attempts, what is the, the max interval um, for the retries, and when should the retry timeout at max. So there, there are some more options, and I, I put them all in a file which is the um, which you might have seen, which is the local settings um, dot JSON file that we have here, um, where I have specified all that stuff. Okay, so that's all. All the other stuff remains the same, and um, what we will do now is we will um, call the function and well I will show that the stuff that worked before will work again. So we will uh, npm run start now. <coughs> so again we have the endpoint um, which is connected. I will just wait until the um, lock is achieved. Yeah. So um, what we will do now is we will send the request, um, which is accepted, which is good. Now we will no longer take a look at the at the URL. We will now directly go into the storage explorer and uh, take a look at the tables. So we have here this instance. And we see, okay, um, it was the input with the empty dunning area, and we get some information back. Now, what I will do next is I um, will issue a call that has a wrong dunning area. So this will run into an error. So I will um, send this request. Um, which was accepted. So I should see a second instance here. And well, this now ran into an error. Now what happened behind the scene? I will now um, copy the ID and do some, some query here. This one is not needed. Execute the query. Okay. So uh, what happened now? So what happened now is, well, the execution started, the orchestrator started, uh, the task was scheduled, and then the task failed. And then the framework picks up, starts the orchestrator again, and um, creates some, some timers here. I think now I'm. Yeah, it creates a timer, and when the timer fires, the the next task is scheduled, and well, this happened three times because I said that um, four times, four times because I said uh, retry it for four times, and um, well, at the end there was no success, so well, bad luck. The function ran out. So what we can do now, and we also get a lot of error messages for sure, I will do some, some clean up again um, in order to make it more, well, more easier to watch. And what I will do now is um, do some, some um, adjustment. So what I will do now is when When the orchestrator runs on an error, the timer will be scheduled, and when the timer fires, the orchestrator will kick off again and retry um, the call. However, now I will change the input data to a valid Dunning area. So now we should see that the first call will run into an error and the second call will succeed. So let's kick it off again. Open 
the um, call. Let's see. Uh, application started. Yep, we are up and running. So I will now issue a call with the wrong data and when the function kicks off it will first issue the call with the wrong data and then with the right data. So let's send the request. Um, it is accepted. Everything is done. Let's take a look what happened behind the scenes. So we have one um, orchestrator kicked off uh, and we get a result. How could that happen? And did I lie or not? So um, let's see what happens. We have here the task failed, the timer was created, um, the timer was fired again, the orchestration started, the task was rescheduled and now because we, we kind of exchanged the wrong input data, the task could complete and everything went through as expected, the second task was scheduled, the second task was completed and we have all the results that we expected to have. So that is, I think, a really cool and helpful feature of the, um, of the Azure uh, Functions Framework that we can use in order to, well, model all the uh, um, problems that might come up when you call a backend system. So um, let's see what, what might be another point that we might want to take a look at. So um, we have now handled errors with a retry, um, but maybe there is no error coming from the backend system. So maybe the backend system simply does not respond at all. Now, you can say, okay, we, we have Azure Functions and they will time out at a certain point in time because we functions as a service usually tend to time out at a certain point in time. That's the idea. Um, yeah, we can wait for that for five minutes and pay for the five minutes or we can introduce a race condition. So we say to the orchestrator, please do the following. I have a race condition, so wait for at max, let's say five seconds and schedule the activity. And whatever returns first is the winner. And when the activity returns, everything is fine. And when the um, timer returns, raise an error. Now, how can we do that with Azure Durable Functions? Does Azure Durable Functions help us in there? And of course it does. So let's um, check out funk retry timeout no oh. I have uh, well I just simply commit that quickly And now let's check out that one. Okie dokie. Um, I will also quickly clean up the uh, Storage Explorer. Okay. So, uh, what did we change now? Now we introduce a racing condition. How do we do that? We um, first say we do a call activity with retry, um, as we said before, and then we introduce something that's um, a bad line, where we use the uh, moment.utc function, and then we create a timer based on this bad line. And well, we say, hey, durable function framework, when any of these two tasks of the Dunning level tasks, so of the execution of the activity or the timeout task returns, whoever is the winner, um, do the following stuff. Now what I did in order to make the, the call unsuccessful, I um, put in here 
a little sleep um, message and um, well the timeout threshold um, with this given here is 2000 milliseconds so um, by design the function will time out and uh, I will run into an error. So um, yeah that's basically it. No more to do in order to, to model such a race condition. So um, let us see how this works out. So again let's kick off our function. Let's open up the HTTP call. So we will now issue really a, a correct call, but we will let it time out. So let's see, host clock is required. So uh, let's send the request. So it was accepted. Now quite some things should go on in the background. Um, we can take a look at the um, the status. Let's see what the status tells us. Um, yeah, it said it failed. Uh, Non-deterministic workflow required. That's kind of the, the standard error message. So let's see what happened behind the curtains. Let's refresh the stuff. Take a look at what happened within the history. Um, so we have the execution started, the task was scheduled, the timer was created, and the timer fired. And that's, well, what happened? The orchestrator says, hey, um, now I have a problem. And within the logic that I implemented within the orchestrator, an, an exception is raised, and the Azure Function Framework aborts all the stuff when um, this, this exception is raised. So we have this non-deterministic workflow message. You can also do other handling. Uh, when you deal with, with message buses, you will put probably the message into a dead letter queue and then pick it up at a later point in time or, or something like that. So um, again, what did we thought we, what did we gain? So we now have split up our single monolithic function into two activities. We can do retries, we can even deal with timeouts without many effort just by configuration, just by adding a timer and all the other stuff is handled behind the scenes. Now one point that's also worth to address is what happens if we have a scale out and we have errors within the backend system and we have a lot of more requests, so more and more, and every request has, has an error. And due to the request to the backend, even if the backend might recover, we hammer the backend down. This can be an SAP system, this can be a database, this can be anything which has some, some limited resources that is trying to recover and might rec be recovering, but due to the fact that we are serverless, we scale out, as hell, um, we give hell to the backend and we hammer it down. So this is usually the, the point in time where you would introduce uh, circuit breakers in order to avoid such a situation. Now the question is, can we also do that with Azure Durable Functions? Do we have something like an external state that we can use as an as a kind of overall state even if my function scales out? And the answer is with the, well, not latest, but quite new release of other Azure Functions, we can do that. So let's do the necessary, let's clear up everything. And um, let's take a look at um, what we have as a circuit breaker. Let's close everything here. So what you see now is 
we have a new folder with a new function. And this function is um, an entity trigger type function and it's a durable entity. What does this mean? This durable entity is um, kind of an overall state for a function app that can be triggered from well activities or orchestrators and um, here within the TypeScript we have to model this function in a, in a not so nice way so um, we have kind of to define an initial state of our function we um, can request the, the current state that is stored and now in contrast to the durable function framework that we saw before where we have this state handling but we have it internally we now can have that explicitly so we can influence the state of the function so we can tell the function hey I have an error hey please reset to an initial value hey what's your state and this is handled no matter from which function it is called so um, even if I have a, a scale out scenario it will react the right way um, what I did here I modeled a little tiny circuit breaker so if a certain amount of errors occurs within a certain area uh, a certain interval of time um, the, the circuit breaker will switch open um, where I have uh, let's take a look where I have um, the, the circuit breaker enum open and closed so when the circuit breaker has the state value one it's 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 closed and when it's uh, opens up it has the value zero um, and within the the orchestrator function I now check for example if there is um, if the circuit breaker state is open if yes I, I raise an error because I must not be called so I avoid to hammer down my, my backend resource um, and here for the for the sake of the demo I just call the first function and I will let it run into errors and also within the function I have some additional code in order to respect um, the, the circuit breaker and to take it into account so I read the entity state and um, check if it exists and if it exists if it's open and whenever an error occurs I will signal to my durable entity that an error occurred with the current date and the entity ID and well this will tell then my durable entity hey an error occurred it will check the current date it will, it will check the time interval and so on and so forth and um, will then act accordingly and all the other logic like is the circuit breaker state open or not will fall into place and the um, execution might be aborted so let's take a look at, at this scenario so I will um, build it kick it off um, I have here now the um, rest call I can invoke it with the, the right data I can invoke it with the wrong data I will invoke it with the wrong data in order to, to run into an error um, and I will kick that off quite some times in order to make sure that the circuit breaker opens up so I will now send the request once twice three times and now let's see how our um, stuff looks like so we take a look at the tables and now we should see not only our durable orchestration information here and here which are probably all ran into errors but we also have here this circuit breaker entity um, that I defined as a as kind of topic and um, well here we see that the circuit breaker state is zero if you remember zero means it's open so there was an error and there were even eight errors that it encountered uh, that have been signaled to um, the, the durable entity 
and that's why it opened up and that's why all this stuff bought it. Um, for yeah, when we take a look at the history there is there's not really a lot to see it's basically um, what we see here is that some events are sent due to the uh, interaction with the um, with the uh, durable entity and some events are raised yeah so at the end of the day a lot of mess here a lot of things happened but the circuit breaker opened up so I can now no longer call my backend system um, and hammer it down although I had this kind of, of, of scaling out of having issued a lot of calls in a very short time I made sure due to the durable entity that I could make a cut so um, yeah that was kind of the last part that I wanted uh, to to show you so uh, what have we achieved up to now we have split up our Azure durable function into several activities that are orchestrated we have retry we have timeouts and we even have circuit breakers so we can manage the state explicitly over several um, orchestration executions so um, now I have no more to, sh to show to you so I will shortly summarize all the stuff so I think uh, durable functions are really a great add-on for Azure functions um, that allow you to really handle uh, complex situations and that allow you to easily do your side-by-side -side extensions in the SAP ecosystem making use of, of serverless um, functionality durable functions manage all the state for you so they as I said allow the model or modeling of uh, complex scenarios without losing the benefits of functions as a service that's important so you only pay for what you use you still have your your kind of atomic building blocks the entry barrier to try it out and to work with it is super low so um, there is this great support as you have seen for local development and from my perspective even having um, the, the serverless offering on SAP Cloud Platform this stuff here opens up a completely new world of, of options that you have in the context of side-by-side -side extensibility now all the stuff that I've showed you is available on github and I will link all the, the uh, blogs uh, and, and stuff that is relevant for that at uh, at the, the description of this video. So, um, well, thank you for your attention and I hope I could share some interesting information to you concerning side-by-side -side extensibility with Microsoft Azure Functions. Bye-bye.